Warning, the following program contains content and language that may be inappropriate for younger viewers. There are graphic depictions and portrayals of addiction that will be shown. Parental discretion is advised. Hello, I'm Steve Kendall, your host for WBGU-TV's series about addiction. In this series, it's our goal to peel back the layers of opiate addiction and expose them to the public in hopes of bringing a solution to this epidemic. In Ohio, we're averaging a loss of six lives every single day. And as a nation, we're sure that number is substantially higher. Every day, people are suffering in silence and are unsure of where to turn for help. As we move forward, education and prevention will represent a major part of a multifaceted solution. Education of all groups and prevention on multiple levels will be necessary to turn the tide in this battle. We now present to you part five of our series, Addiction, Heroin and Pills, Education and Prevention. The state of Ohio, along with the rest of the United States, is suffering from an epidemic. Addiction to prescription pain medication is at an all-time high, and it's routinely leading many to heroin abuse. This epidemic boils down to one thing, pain. Whether it be emotional or physical pain, how we deal with it is at the root of this epidemic and should be examined closely. When we've got an epidemic this size, it seems smart to say, oh my gosh, let's really do a biopsy and figure out how we got here and see if we can make sure we never get here again. There is such a perfect storm that happened with this particular epidemic. Our medical community has helped to train us. The market has helped to train us as consumers. What is your pain level? And in great cases, in many cases, these people are being reimbursed for improvement, being able to demonstrate an improvement. We are being conditioned that pain is not natural, that it is something to uh, take a pill. We are a take a pill society, take a pill and knock it out. The television te tells us, the radio, the internet, everything tells us, you know, there's a pill for everything. In the state of Ohio in 2012, for every man, woman, and child, it was estimated that there were 67 pills, opiate pills, given per person. In Europe, for every man, woman, and child, there were two pills per person. So that speaks volumes about not just the state of Ohio, but really, you know, when we talk about this is a national problem, the national problem suggests we don't like to feel pain in any way, shape, or form. And if you can give me a pill to deal with it, the happier I'm going to be. And you put all of that together on top of the pressure that our society is under, you have a perfect storm for prescription drug abuse. This is, is a huge task that we are all challenged with. It's frightening um, to think that if we don't get a handle on this, what our future looks like. Prevention is going to be key. I, I don't think we can wait until the disease has already progressed to the point that they need medication-assisted treatment. That's not the goal. Um, and and medication-assisted treatment is not the answer. We have to, to do the prevention. We have to start asking the right questions educating not only within our school systems of our young children, but it's also educating our providers, our healthcare providers. Healthcare seems to have said, that's not me, um, that belongs over here with community mental health and addiction, but it's not in my world. And what we have to get them to understand, it is your world. This belongs to you, it belongs to all of us. The education of the public about prescription drug abuse will play a major role in the future of this epidemic and our society as a whole. Whether it be for prescription use or recreation, we all need to understand the ramifications of opiate use before we consume them. How and when we educate about these drugs will be vital for success in this epidemic.
It's important for us to, to uh, consider education and prevention first because even someone with an addictive um, personality, so to speak, or someone prone to addiction, if they don't try uh, an opiate in the first place, then they can't become addicted to it. So if we can start very early and, and let these folks know that if you try this stuff, um, there's a very good chance that you're gonna end up hooked and you're not gonna be able to quit even when you want to. Education plays such a key role in preventing this issue. When you look at prevention as a science, education is a real key strategy in prevention. Now, there are a lot of other strategies in prevention besides education, but that is a real key element. And everyone needs education. Older people need education. Adults certainly need education. Small children need education. The days of scare tactics I wish were over. Unfortunately, this opiate and heroin epidemic is scaring every adult in the world. And so we just think if they knew how bad it was, they'd never do it. So I'm going to go out and tell them just how bad it is and tell them all the worst examples of what has happened or could happen to someone. And that's just not how kids learn. What we need to do is prepare them, not scare them. And so we need to prepare them for those moments of choice. And that means they need healthy attitudes and beliefs and they need the skills to follow it through so whether that's decision making skills coping skills refusal skills in that moment of how to say no and turning a drink or a drug down without turning a friend off I think the medical professionals also need a lot of education um, they know a lot about the actual medication they know a lot about the actual physical condition I think one thing they need to know about is the science of addiction that addiction is a brain disease I think doctors and nurses and other medical professionals could benefit by being taught how to ask the right questions and ask the questions in a right way that the patient's more likely to give really accurate information about their relationship, their past relationship with prescription medications, particularly opiates. The thing I've come to realize uh, through the, the last two or three years is how important parents are to um, uh, inoculating their children, providing them with the, the wherewithal to, to be able to deal with the issue when it faces them. I think it's important to empower parents first with education. I will admit I didn't realize that the pills in my pill cabinet were a risk to my teens or to other teens. I didn't know that. I didn't know kids were doing that. I didn't know they were going into their parents' and their grandparents' medicine cabinets, taking pills that weren't meant for them and downing them with a beer. I didn't know that. So education empowers. Parents are afraid to talk about drugs. I don't like to talk about it. It's uncomfortable. I don't like to think that it could happen in my own home. But one thing that we have learned on this journey is that drug abuse doesn't discriminate. There are overdoses taking place in every kind of household and every kind of community you could imagine. There isn't just that type of kid or that type of family. It's everywhere. When you take a look at who is abusing most prescription medications, it's a middle-aged white male. I mean, it is adults that are abusing, so the education can really target them and their use. It's also powerful to educate them because they're parents. Um, or are there people that have influence over small children, grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles that have influence over children. And again, they are very powerful with those children. So if they can be educated on what their kids need to know and how they're, and what's happening with children and what some, of the prep, what some of the trends are right now with children and using prescription medications and other drugs, that can be very powerful. They're also voters. They're taxpayers. They're the people that can vote on public policy. Um, around this issue. So they're a very, a very powerful people to educate. They are that sweet spot, I think, for education. As education becomes increasingly more important, so does the act of prevention. Preventative methods to deter people from abusing prescription pain medication will be key as we move forward. Preventing future generations from making the same mistakes is imperative for success. Good prevention is a science, so we follow the guidelines of good prevention, and that means a multi-systemic approach. That means involving communities, schools, parents, young people. That means early and often in the classroom or in the uh, YMCA or wherever youth gather. With good prevention, we're trying to do four things. 
We're trying to increase peer disapproval, parental disapproval, community disapproval, and perception of harm. I think when people talk about prevention with opiates and, and heroin, particularly with heroin, um, heroin is in a lot of ways not a prevention issue because nobody starts with heroin. Uh, and, and four out of five new heroin users had first started with opiates or abuse of prescription pain medicine. So if we don't um, widen our lens from a prevention point of view, we can't, there are things we can and need to do that are substance specific, but there are also things that we, we need to widen our lens when it comes to this issue and place opiate and heroin within the full continuum of substance abuse. I think all prevention has to begin early. So with youth, you want to start very early and continue on through the lifespan. When looking at youth behaviors in relationship to youth drug use, you might notice an increase in agitation. You might notice mood changes. You might notice a drop in grades. You might also notice that friends are changing. Now, parents also report that items of value they find disappearing from the home. And why is that? Because the progression from one pill to five pills happens very, very quickly. And that's because the particular type of opiates that we're talking about bind to the receptor sites in the brain. And once that happens, it really produces a euphoric kind of situation. And it takes more to give the person the same sensation. So that takes money. If you do have medications in your home uh, and kids in your home, are you monitoring those medications? And are the kids self, you know, able to self-dose or you know, are they of an age where the parent's dosing them? If the kids are of an older age where they might be self-dosing, the parents should still be monitoring that. And how quickly are those meds going down? So securing the meds, monitoring the meds, and of course disposing of old meds when they're no longer needed. For adults, it's a little bit harder because adults are often working, they have money, they can buy things. It is pretty pervasive out there in the community. So one of the other things you wanna do with prevention is you wanna reduce access. And that's one of the hard pieces of problem solving this opiate epidemic. A lot of communities now have permanent um, prescription drop boxes. There's been a, a great deal of work done on the access and availability issue. And certainly getting the pill mills closed was a, a big piece of this puzzle. But there's so much more to be done beyond access and availability. We've got to look at our community norms. When people talk about prevention, everyone thinks about when everyone just needs to know the facts. If they knew how bad this was, they'd never do it. And people do need a perception of risk of harm, and they do need to know the negative consequences of use of opiates and, and even of heroin, certainly. But I think they also need so much more um, that we have to look at this environmentally and where are we as a culture uh, around this as well. The response of hundreds of communities across the state of Ohio has been very proactive. These efforts have spawned the birth of many grassroots organizations, county task forces, and special advocate groups. Developed and led by the state of Ohio, the Start Talking program is leading the way in many prevention and education efforts. Start Talking is Ohio's youth drug prevention program. It was launched by Governor Kasich in January 2014 in response to the prescription drug epidemic that Ohio is facing. Drug overdose is a public health epidemic and drug overdoses have actually surpassed car crashes as a leading cause of death in Ohio. And this equates to approximately six deaths every 24 hours. The goal of the program being providing parents and other adults such as teachers, law enforcement officers, folks in the community with free, simple, easy tools to get these conversations started. Research showed us that young people are 50% less likely to try drugs, 50% less likely if someone of authority talks to them about not using drugs while they're young. There's no time to waste in attacking the opiate addiction problem in Ohio. It's kind of like that African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village of resources to address the addiction problem in our state. And so we are doing that whether it is with law enforcement, whether it's with the medical team, medical communities, whether it is communication or working with community organizations. So there's a whole 
lot of different spokes to this wheel. As a parent, I think most of you are concerned about all these illegal drugs, the heroin, the marijuana, uh, the meth, but you need to understand that the legal drugs are just as dangerous. They're getting it from your neighbors, your friends. It's not hard at all. If people are taking prescription drugs for non-medical purposes, they are not taking medicine. They're doing drugs. The Parents 360 RX initiative is a really key part of the Start Talking program. And this initiative is our community education piece that arms parents with the ability to have these conversations, these critical conversations with our kids across the state. And it helps to build confidence and make these conversations easier. These people that we're losing to drug overdoses and to addiction are not just statistics. They're people. They're human beings. They have families. They work and go to school in our communities. They contribute to the health and wealth of our state. They are human beings, so it's easy to look at statistics and say, oh, we lost 200 people to opiate uh, addictions or to overdoses. If we can get people to start talking with the young people in their lives early, then we can maybe have a better chance at preventing drug use in the first place. We want to encourage parents, teachers, other adults in the community to not just start talking, but to keep talking. And just wanted to reiterate the importance of prevention and the important role that not just parents, but teachers, law enforcement officers, physicians, the important role that they play in prevention and the, the fact that they really do have power to help prevent drug use before it ever starts. Another organization that is making a name for itself is the Addict's Parent, also known as TAP. With a major focus on the relationship between the addicted family member and the entire family unit, TAP aims to raise awareness about the toll of addiction on families. TAP is the addict's parent, and it's uh, a group that's come together for a unison type of an aspect so that we can involve everybody in the family, not just the mother, not just the father, but the sisters and brothers and the aunts and our uncles. It's birthed out of Ohio, and then we're going to spread nationwide. So we're expecting right now to have you know, 30 to 40,000 members in this group. My son Andrew was 27 um, years old, you know, October 3rd, 2012, when he died from a, an overdose of heroin. And he had actually been in recovery, uh, working a program for uh, about three months. Prior to that, it was in July of 2012, he had overdosed and died at a dealer's house. At the same time, I had a younger son also, who my older son had been teaching the ways of using drugs. And Aaron had overdosed in band at the school. Parents are going through uh, multifaceted uh, areas of addiction, you know, where they may have one in recovery and they have one active. I have four children. My oldest daughter is 27. My son is 24. They are the addicts um, in my family. I also have a 20-year-old and an 11-year-old. It's great to be in an organization where you're with people who understand you. You can call upon each other night and day if you're having a bad day and you're there to support each other. And we all have been through it, so we kind of understand where each other's coming from. My biggest thing I would say to parents is, get yourself to a meeting. There is support. Talk to other parents and know that we cannot fix their addiction. They have to fix their own addiction. I mean, we can give them all the resources in the world, but it's up to us to get ourselves into recovery and work on ourselves. That's a whole part of what TAP is about also, is bringing the family together, understanding, educating them about addiction, and that it is a disease, and that they need to work together as a family unit in order to combat this disease and get help for their child and for their family unit so it doesn't fall apart. Um, I think that there are parents out there right now that are struggling who are in bed with the covers over their head and they don't know who to turn to. And I think TAP will be able to help the family unit. 
TAP's continued plan to have rallies. It's very important to bring those people together and they know that they're not alone and there are resources for them. We want people to feel hope with this because when you have two or three children that have been sucked into this, for parents, that can be devastating. With thousands of organizations and programs all working toward one common goal, the future of fighting this epidemic looks promising. We need to explore our cultural norms as a nation while placing education and prevention at the forefront of this battle. By setting strategic priorities, we can regain our families and our communities. There are very legitimate reasons why we're in the predicament we're in with prescription drugs. Then you take a black market, um, dealers in heroin, for example, who say, oh, I've got a new market. The prescription drugs got them hooked, and all I have to do is lay in wait when they come out of their treatment facility and introduce them to heroin, and I've got a full-time client. And that's what we're seeing. This is a major marketing business for illicit drugs, and they have a ready market that we've helped to prepare. Because people are driven to change their state of consciousness and there are people who always want to profit from that, we'll always have work to be done. If there is a positive in a crisis like this or an epidemic like this, um, I think it is this community response and that we do have communities coming together across different sectors in ways that hasn't happened quite to this level. We need to create an infrastructure that supports prevention, intervention, treatment, recovery support across all our communities. And we need a system that is nimble enough to respond to the next crisis because their trends do come and go. And, and I don't mean to belittle impacts that people have had from this current crisis. There will be something else that comes. Uh, and so if we, we have to be nimble as communities to respond to those crises while also working on long-term strategic efforts to decrease the chance and the severity of that next thing that's going to come. Through the years, different drugs are popular, so to speak. I mean, we've had the uh, methamphetamine, we've had ecstasy, we've had heroin has been here for a long, long time. This isn't a new problem. It's been around for, for ages. Even if we eliminate opiate, prescription opiate abuse, uh, and even heroin, uh, there's certainly something coming along the way. So this isn't entirely a, a drug problem, a uh, specific drug problem, as much as it is a societal problem and, and a problem of addiction. Uh, addiction is a disease, I believe that's the case, and I believe that's been borne out a, a number of times. And that until we can treat this disease, uh, we're gonna continue to have problems. So any, any time that we take action, any time that, that we make an effort and, and are successful in that effort, there's gonna be unintended consequences. And we've seen that with the prescription drug, by, by eliminating that or minimizing that, we've seen an increase in heroin abuse. Uh, it's a difficult problem to eradicate. As long as there's a, a demand, uh, there'll be a supply. We can dramatically change the course of this opiate epidemic and prevent future epidemics. I truly believe that, but we have to look at the lessons that we are learning from where we're at right now. 25 years ago, we had the tobacco epidemic. We had people dying from tobacco use. We hit it hard with prevention and education, and youth use now is, is at a very, very low rate. I wish I had a crystal ball, I don't, but I do know that good prevention works if we apply it. As much as communities come together, and parents continue the good work of talking to their young people. And schools allow that venue for good prevention education programs. I think we can and will make a difference. I would like to thank you for joining us for part five of our series. Education and prevention will be some of the most important factors as we move forward through this epidemic we are currently facing. Ohio is averaging a loss of six lives every day. It's up to us to fix this. Someone you know is suffering and is at risk of overdose and possibly even death. This is a serious issue for a lot of families and it's our job to shed some light on this dark subject. Make sure you take some time to educate yourself and your family members. For WBGU-TV, I'm Steve Kendall. We'll see you next time.
If you or someone you know is dealing with an addiction, please call one of the numbers on your screen to get help. Recovery is only one call away. You can also log on to the State of Ohio's Start Talking website to get more information and assistance.